All right, everyone, welcome back to Wish Creative Conversations. And today with me, I have editor Ryan Dayhoff. How's it going, bro? It's good to be here, man. It's been a while. It's good to be in touch. Yes. So Ryan and I know each other from um, from college, actually. And uh, and I forced him to edit my senior thesis because he didn't want to do it. <laughs> so we were co-editing that. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so you're, you're uh, a freelance... Uh, editor in LA. Uh, but before I tell everyone who you are, I think you're probably the expert on you. So you can tell us who you are and kind of like, uh, what is your like specialty in editing? And yeah, just kind of some of the things you've done. Who are you, Ryan Dayhoff? Answer that question. What is Ryan Dayhoff? What is Ryan Dayhoff? I don't know, man. I'm still figuring it out every day. But uh, I'm a 26-year-old freelance editor living out in California, I, born and raised here, so I haven't really had to make any hard moves uh, to another state, but I've just kind of been out here doing, like, very, like, short-form editing work, so I've done, like, you know, Coachella visuals or music videos or, like, little commercials. I feel like my uh, interest in film never came from, like, big fi feature films as much, although I love those. Those are inspiring, but, like, I'm really into the short form stuff. I think what what's happening with like content is like really cool these days, how people are just like pushing out things and they need to be edited. So it's really nice to be a freelance editor and have people have your number and contact when they can contact you. But I've just been kind of working my hand at that. We went to film school. I've been out of school for like, gosh, like four years now. And it's kind of wild to like think back to how long ago that was, but like how much it's like, tracked with me like what i've learned and stuff like that but yeah i'm just a 26 year old freelancer making it working trying to make it but doing well so far so it's been good okay so i i think most people that go to film school and and um i don't know if this was your experience we had the same experience we were we were in school at the same time but i feel like a lot of people who go to film school um enter in as a writer director or not even writer sometimes just basically they want to be directors um and then usually they like split <laughs> like by like sophomore year someone wants to be an editor someone wants to be a dp someone wants to be a writer most people realize they're not really good at directing or that once you uh play your like visual aesthetics project in front of dean yamada <laughs> and he breaks your soul then you realize you're not as cool as you thought but um did you like did you go into film school thinking you were going to be an editor and why 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 editing out of like all the aspects that people think and like about like filmmaking when you see like bts the last thing you'll see is someone in a room <laughs> just editing in a dark place in a cave somewhere yeah man i mean it started when i was little and i learned how to make slideshows in iMovie so i mean i guess that does kind of count as editing but I've kind of just had a passion with telling stories with like pieces of like a puzzle essentially. And I'm really into like durations, runtime, speed, stuff like that. So it's kind of cool to have a profession where you can just integrate all those things. I'm also really OCD. So like being able to organize all my stuff is really nice. Uh, I feel like people on set just have to kind of work with what they're given. And, you know, when someone's as OCD as I am, it's just like, you know, you wish everything had a higher standard of being kept well and stuff like that. But when I went to film school, I got in touch with a lot of people who did Grip and Electric, and I got involved with stuff like that. And I learned a lot of really cool things. Probably the most, like, practical job for, like, life skills would probably be Grip and Electric. Um, I'm, I'm really good at rigging things, I guess. But... No, you just get better at like being practical with things. And I think that was like a really beneficial part in editing too. Because like when you're doing stuff like Grip and Electric in film school, you're kind of just like wondering like what's a safe way, what's a quick way to do this, like efficiency and like safety, like taking so many things into account. So I think my start with film school is really cool. But I think I never lost that like desire to like piece a film together like it's it's cool to have that responsibility for all these departments working long hours to kind of give you these pieces to put together that everyone's kind of worked towards and being that like final person to kind of piece that together I think that's a cool responsibility and I think it's mm -hmm. something that I value a lot and I mean I don't usually get into arguments with people who are like my department's like most important films like a such a collaborative thing 
and everyone in film school is like learning about like how their department plays like a role and stuff like that. And I think the coolest thing about film school is like when everyone kind of found their niche of like what department they wanted to do, like it was cool to talk to people and they were just like, I feel like my department's the most important. And that's like a cool thing because like, you know, I feel like it's not a bad thing if everyone working in film and stuff like that thinks their job is the most important because that means they're very like motivated to do a very good job. And like, I honestly think editing is the most important just because I feel like I like integrated into film with the things of editing being the most important things to me. So I think it's really cool to to be an editor in that sense and understand that we're all kind of working our jobs, our passions, and when it all comes to the end and you're piecing it together with editing, it's just it's just a totally cool world and I never lost my spark for it. It's 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 my favorite. I love it. Now, uh, yeah, it's so interesting navigating film. Film school is like a social experiment, I feel like. Uh, it's just really interesting how it plays out when everyone kind of just goes into their own little crib and starts, like, art. I remember, like, at Viola, it was, like, our department was always, like, our department pride or something. Like, it was always, like, they were... They thought they were like the the most important, which I guess you mentioned that that's good. But like they were always like so proud, so so proud of, of of the work they do, and like uh, just like a camaraderie that I, I honestly like didn't see in, in I guess other departments. Um, I think for me, I always stick with sound department as being my favorite. We got like our own thing going on. We're not worried about most of the other crap that I don't like about filming. <laughs> the proud, man. Yeah. I love well, I, I, right, right now, so like, I'll, I'll tell you this, I have been editing almost every day because th that's just kind of like my lifestyle right now. Just like doing a lot of like client stuff and also just things for Wish Creative. And uh, I'm getting so bored and tired of it. Um, we actually like hired an intern to help a little bit with the editing. Because I was just like, I, I literally, I can't sit here for much longer and just like stare at a screen, which is really interesting because like coming to like to, uh, to your point, like when I, when I went into film school, I thought I was going to be an editor, which was a really interesting, I guess, point of view, because I feel like not a lot of people do that. Uh, but then I transitioned into like, no, nah, actually I, I want to be a writing director and like, I guess there's a lot of learning in that sense, but uh, but now I see like I I could not be an editor like full time. Uh, I'm so glad I uh, I kind of diversified my my skills into other different things because I, I just I just can't stare at a screen. Um, how are you doing with that perspective? Are you like at any point getting tired of editing? Uh, is it is it too much? Is it too much loneliness? Is it too much like <laughs> just I don't know? I I I get lonely if I just edit for like too long I, I mean i'll take my dog out and i'm just gonna go on a walk because i i can't i can't just keep doing it forever so uh how are you feeling i think the only way i'm able to stay editing long hours is by going outside is by taking a break i had a conversation with someone where i would say that my best ideas come when i'm not editing because you kind of do need to balance your perspective and stuff like that but with that comes also your sanity like you really got to take care of yourself i had a job where i was editing a music festival i was editing content for it in palm springs and i wasn't taking care of myself at all it was like a couple of years ago and i went home and i literally passed out and had to go to the er and like palm springs and it was just like this weird wake-up call of like you're a person first man like Mm -hmm. I, I I love what I do and you know I'll work my butt off for it but like people got to just prioritize themselves in this like you have to take care of yourself to be creative you have to give yourself that chance I I thought I could just battle my way through getting all the work done and deal with whatever fatigue and stuff like that and it just comes back to the fact that we're all humans with capabilities and stuff like that like we can't just like muscle out like 16 hours a day or it's not healthy to um i feel like i i've fallen in love with what i do but it also depends on the project like you kind of go into these different worlds and i as a freelance editor work on different things like in a day like maybe like two or three projects a day even 
And like, it's just nice to dip into different worlds with editing. Cause I feel like if I was editing one project that I just was not stoked on, which I have many times, like I get tired of that in like an hour. Like I just, you know, you just get over it and you got to like create a, a cycle where you can take a break, where you can kind of enjoy the outside, which is harder now because of quarantine, but still like there's things you can definitely do and they go a long way just drinking a lot of water just going on a walk uh, stuff like that that keep you sane and keep you happy too and keep you happy doing something like editing because it's not fun to lock yourself in a room by yourself um thankfully i have a therapist aka uh, my girlfriend who hears all my rants and she just i don't know if she's tired of it or not that's fine but like <laughs> You know, you just got to balance it. You can't bubble yourself in with editing and stuff like that. You got to be a human being and you got to take care of yourself in that sense. That's that's very much the important thing, because when you're done with the project, that's what you're going to take out of it mostly is yourself. And you don't want to have like hurt yourself in the sense of, you know, going crazy and going beyond what you should be doing health wise. And it's right. important stuff. But there's just so many different aspects to it. Creatively, I think editing is so overwhelming because there's just so many little things you do and when it comes to it you give a a cut like people are just going to look at one or two things that you may have overlooked because you were you know doing a hundred creative decisions an hour like that's what it comes down to you're making so many decisions quickly and a lot of people quit editing because they just can't take it because like criticism is just overbearing and you just really have to understand that you can't be hard on yourself like crazy it's like a hundred like i said a hundred creative decisions an hour almost if you're working at a certain pace and like you just gotta take it into perspective to kind of keep the endurance going and stuff like that you can't bury yourself because it's 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 not normal it's terrible so you, you gotta yeah. do that yeah i think one of the this is like a me problem that i have is that i um very much of a hermit and, and you probably know this because and I feel like you're not. You, you are the kind of person who's always like, let's get boba right now. <laughs> like, let's just go out and like throw like things aside for a second and uh, be social. And I, that's just that's just not me. I'm not very sporadic. I'm actually kind of a boring person who's uh, who's always just like home. I like being home. I like reading and watching movies and uh, I like going on walks. I enjoy that, but I'm not very, you know, let's go out at all, you know, all the time. Um, but I feel like to be an editor, like you almost have to force yourself to do those things. You have to like for yourself, yourself to like get out of the house. Now with quarantine, I'm sure. How is that? How's that played out? Because uh, I mean, if if you counted on going out in order to like counterbalance, did it? Was it harder for you to be in quarantine because you've already been home a lot and then you have to stay home more? Or has it been like, I'm already used to this, so it's easier? I mean, I'm a big concert goer, but over the last couple months, I like would just neglect going to concerts and like going out and stuff like that just because I was like, I need to get work done and I need to like focus. And now I'm just like, why did I do that? Because now there's like nothing to do outside. I will say that my lifestyle adapted a lot easier than other people's just because like I work remote. Uh, I don't have to go to an office. I can stay home and work. So like that was really nice to kind of just keep that going. Um, but like I'd see like people like family members and like friends would go hysterical because they're used to going out. It's almost like their home is like going out and being out. That's their like home. That's their safe place. That's their happy place. And to like lose that, that's almost if someone was like, you can't be in your home like during this time. And I had to just be outside the whole time. Like that would scare the heck out of me, man. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I love being home. I love having my space. I love just like ingesting things uh, from the internet, reading, watching movies. Um, and like, I feel like I like to keep it minimal at home too. I had a moment in LA where I just went into this creative crisis of being overwhelmed with like ev all everything everyone's doing and like FOMO of like projects and stuff like that, where I literally ripped all like the vinyls and like posters off my wall because I couldn't just look at so much art. I was just like, so like, overwhelmed by it and stuff like that and 
I kind of created home to be this like safe space where I can just kind of breathe and more like meditate rather than having to like force myself to be crazy creative and like keep up with what I thought the world was creatively and what the people are making and stuff like that. I, I kind of attributed my room and stuff like that to having to like make things constantly, which also I learned like having your office be your room is just like, you got to separate that. Mm. It, it's, 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 it's very, very anxiety ridden to like wake up and like your editing software to be right there and being like, I got to get straight to work and stuff like that. You feel like you don't have like time for yourself and stuff like that. But with yeah. quarantine, it's a little different because I, I've just become accustomed to staying inside and doing things. And I can still go on walks. You know, I could still do things. I can still get boba. You got to wear a mask. But honestly, I'm such a germaphobe and like all about my personal space that like it's honestly nice that people are wearing masks now. I think I, I don't want them to like panic about it. And I also think the word quarantine is a very panic induced word like. Like, yeah. I don't know. I think stay at home and phrases like that are good. But like quarantine, it sounds like the apocalypse. Like the first time I heard it, I think of like the nuclear like logo with all the stuff, you know, like yeah. it, it just it just has that vibe. And I never liked that word. And I feel like a lot of this is in people's heads because I feel like people don't, especially with like social media and like influencers. I feel like people don't always live the lives that like they project themselves to and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I feel like it kind of just puts into perspective the fact that everyone has like this life to go back to, to an extent, you know, I feel like it's a lot easier for me because quarantine was something we all just kind of like fell into and we didn't really prepare for it. And however equipped we were to do so, the better, but some people just weren't ready. Like a lot of people were doing terribly financially and now, you know, their businesses are having trouble and things are just, it's a trap really. So I, I think I was blessed to really have a situation that I can just kind of like lean back into with quarantine yeah. stuff like that. I like the word quarantine, but for its literal uh, meaning, which quarantine is supposed to mean 40 days. Uh, and it's definitely not been 40 days. <laughs> Cause when you translate it in Spanish, like it makes, it makes sense. Like quarantine, you're only like, at least in Spanish, you're like, it, it, it translate as, as like actually 40 days. And I'm like, okay, we're just going into 40 days of staying home. It, it it's taking a meaning beyond that it's like it's like four months so far you know uh it, but it's like so interesting like uh, yes um let's talk about your setup too because because you mentioned something there of like i think one thing that's not really talked about in in terms of like editing is like mental health and like making sure especially with freelance like you uh you and me like stay home to edit and uh that's it seems nice and it is nice, but it, it comes with a lot of negative sides to that. Like for me, uh, like last year when I was, um, I had like quit my, my job um, as a teacher. And then I went into this, in, into opening this business and, and getting clients and all that. And man, I, I like do not recommend those like six, six to nine months that I spent home alone. Um, literally for like nine to 10 hours. I was just stay home and work and with like the anxiety of like, oh, I don't even know if I'm getting any clients right now. Like there were some months where I made zero dollars. Some months where I m- made more than I used to make in my t- uh, teaching days. But uh, it's just not, it's just not a healthy place if you don't stay ahead of the game. And like, I feel like for every editor who wants to be an editor out there and wants to work from home, like uh, that's like one of the first things you need to look at. It's like, uh, how, how does your space uh, and, and your schedule and your finances even like, how does that, how can you like stay ahead of the game so you're not falling into this trap? It is storming in here. Um, what, is it raining? Yeah, it's it's raining terribly. I think I think the, the people might hear it. I woke up this morning and like, I thought it was a hurricane. Like I looked out my window and like the palm trees were bending. Um, so that's just little Florida things. I hope uh, you're safe, man, but I, I, I never mind a little ambiance, so. Well, I, funny thing, I'm living in a house that was built in the 20s, so I don't think this, this house is not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. I, it's made out of brick, um, so, I, and I don't think, I don't think, but, you know, um, if there's a hurricane soon, which there might be one coming in the next month or two or whatever, I'm, a, I'm getting out of here. 
Um, oh, man. But that's beyond that's beyond me. How so? You mentioned like you have your own. You separated your room from your office. What what other setups do you have? Like, what is a good investment to make? Like, if I'm an editor and I want to invest money into in, into my craft and I want to invest money into like making sure that my workflow is something that's healthy, like, yeah, where does that money go? Totally. Well, first of all, as you can see behind me, spoiler alert, I had to do some moving in quarantine land. So my office is my room, but I'm kind of coping with it uh, okay. just because I can kind of di differentiate my mindset for when I'm working and when I'm just hanging out in my room and you got to kind of separate that. I feel like, and again, like maybe I'm not the most like technical speaking editor when it comes to like how to get editing done, but I feel like the equipment for like your comfort is like a really big thing as far as like being creative. Like I have this like ergonomic chair that was like a thousand dollars. That's just like super comfortable. And it like goes a long way to kind of take care of like the way you're sitting and stuff like that. I also have a stand up desk, uh, which I love that I got at Costco for like less than 300 bucks. It's like a glass stand up desk and it's just like amazing. I could like literally rise it right now. If, if, you're, <laughs> if you're only listening to this, my, the computer's going up and down because this is my, Like, oh wow it's, it's like electronic yeah it's like remote controlled i have like this little like remote on the side of it that can go up and down and i like will alternate every like hour i'll turn into a stand-up desk and i'll just be standing up and editing and then the other hour i'll just be sitting down and stuff like that something i'm more used to um so i think those have like actually gone a long way i mean I i'll go into like technical stuff in a minute but i feel like when it comes to like editing, you really have to like be all there. You know, you can't be like sore, like from being hunched over the whole time. You, you have to drink a lot of water. You have to go on walks. But I think, you know, the comfort of equipment, like things like a ergonomic chair, stand-up desk are like really worthwhile investments that'll go a long way creatively. Now, ever since I was in film school, I've been working off of like the production center Biola computers And um, those were like pretty big editing suites. But when I go back to my room, like I, I always just went back to my laptop. Um, I bought this 32 gigabyte RAM uh, MacBook recently, actually. I was working on one from 2012 for like a long time. And it yeah. just wore out, man. Like when you're editing, you need to just buy the best you can. Like, because, you know, you're going to make the money back and you're... You, you really just got to invest because this is stuff you're going to be using for your, like your career. Like you can't be like, Oh, I got to save money right now. I, can, I should only buy like 16 gigabytes of Ram for my MacBook instead of 32. Like that's just not the way to think. You got to take like sacrifices and you're going to get over because editing, like you're going to get jobs when you're editing. Like every time you see something on TV, like someone was paid to edit that. Like the great thing about editing is that is, there's such a demand for editors because that's, that's how you get content on the screen. And there's so much, that people are putting forward right now. Everything from music videos to like YouTubers being like, I need someone to edit my content. Um, just stuff like that. So it's been really cool to kind of understand that there's like a little bit more security with getting jobs as far as people reaching out for edits and stuff like that to where I could like buy equipment that I felt was gonna like push me along the way. Um, yeah. So having a MacBook that's like 32 gigabytes, the processor's really good. Um, and my side monitor, it's a very simple setup, you know, it's, it's, it just, it's what I'm used to and it's just what I'm comfortable with. I don't like needing like big computers and like hearing like the, the computer monitors like breathing because they're just taking so much power. It's just like, it's nice to just have, you know, the old school setup and because MacBooks were able to like have that much power, it just was a no brainer for me to kind of stay in that zone. And it was really nice. Yeah, I I uh, I probably need to listen to your advice. I <laughs> I have this. Um, you you know my the computer I have. It was the same the same one I had in college. I'm opening my about this Mac right now, and I'll tell you some of the specs. Like this is terrible. What happened was um, Apple made uh, they disabled uh, Nvidia like graphic cards. So I basically have no GPU. Uh, in my in my computer because um, it's just so dumb. I'm so mad at Apple for doing this. Like I like them, but it's like it's like everyone like and dislike a lot of the things they do, and uh, just like providing no alternative. So so right now I'm literally 
uh, I had to switch my uh, so Premiere and After Effects to go into uh, latching into the RAM, like using RAM as the rendering space as opposed to using the GPU. Uh, and it's like, I'm going insane. <laughs> like I told Sunday and uh, I was like, I told Sunday, I've, I've been so close to just uh, just doing it, just like buying. I, I, I prefer uh, IMAX for, for editing. Uh, Cause I just that's just like my vibe, and I, I don't even like the like twenty seven inch ones. I like twenty four twenty one point five, like just enough for me to like. I I like my screens like just medium sized, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I'm probably gonna get a new computer in the next month, cause uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna set this one's just like it's been a terrible thing and like yeah you're right it, it, I've, I've had moments where like just rendering takes so much longer or exporting or even it just freezes and i just don't think that's that's a very healthy thing to like go through every single day when you're editing dude you're, um, you're worth it man you got to put up the money you got <laughs> you got to just take the hit and work your way back yeah i yeah that it, that's right like i i will i i think the other thing that i'm like, thinking about is like how much computer should I buy? Uh, I'm definitely buying more than this computer. Uh, I wonder like when it's, when is it like not justified to say like, oh, do I get the like Mac Pro? You know, like that's a very nice thing or even some of the other things that are available there. Like I'm wondering if like, it would be like cooler to get one of the other ones. Um, but so I don't know if I want to like save for that before that or if I want to just buy this one now. But anyway, um, you you I, it definitely makes a lot of sense for you to invest into something that will uh again have some sort of ROI um and and how has the world of freelancing been for you in terms of like how how did you get to a place where you're able to sustain yourself doing what you love which in in your case is editing right well, when I started, like I moved to LA and actually my first job was like a real job. It wasn't a freelance job. And I edited from like 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. in an office in Burbank for a CNN documentary series called History of Comedy, which is great. It was a great job. But like, and I wasn't editing, editing, actually. I was a logger. I, I guess every, when I talk to people about editing, they kind of just, classify everything as post-production but no when you get like a real job in LA like you start as a logger then you work your way up to an AE mind you this is all in a night shift because the turnarounds are so fast that the editors are coming in like in the morning and working off of what you did from like 6 p.m to 4 a.m it's a crazy turnaround because of how fast we need to work with this stuff but that was my first job and I learned a lot from that and I thought it would be it would be amazing because I was like, I could do this and I could just work steadily at, for the rest of my life because like I could potentially have worked my way up after like five or so years to become an editor if I made all the right moves. And then I realized like, I don't even think I want to edit these like long TV documentary series things. So like, why am I like working towards that? I already hate the night shift. Like the people I worked with were great, but I just couldn't stand that. So then I decided like full-time freelance was the job, but also I knew that like I had to build my freelance like community. I had to build my connections in that because there's like different worlds with editing. It's not like, you know, I'm an editor. So like the more I edit things, the better I go. No, it's like you can work your way up in like the TV industry and like logging and AEing. You can work your way up in music videos. You can work your way up in assistant editing for like feature film editors and one day getting you know, your first feature film to edit. And I just thought it would be most interesting to edit the things that I found the most interesting, which were music videos, commercials. Um, but until then, I, I like didn't have any connections. So what I had to do actually was edit weddings for a while, which wasn't like my favorite thing to do. Like, I don't like get down on weddings. I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, you do weddings, like, and they're just like not interested in the like LA room. And that's fair, like, because they're very, like, similar to each other, not to put down any creatives in wedding. Filming and editing a wedding can be very tough. But this is what I, like, had to do in order to keep making money and to build connections within that, because there were people who were working in that company who were also doing music videos. And that's how I got, you know, hit up to do other edits for, like, recaps and stuff like that. 
And through that, people saw my work. And then I got to edit things like music videos and stuff like that. But to like sustain, like I knew I had to do stuff that I didn't necessarily want to, but that was going to pay well and was also going to keep me like editing things like practice is like a real thing. You know, the more you edit, the better you get, the more you'll learn. So I thought it was important to kind of keep, I didn't feel bad when I was like repeatedly editing weddings, even though I didn't want to, but that was like four years ago after like just getting into LA and you kind of had to take whatever you got. But then actually I met this guy named Tim, Tim Hendricks, who's bizarre, great dude. Um, And he's a music video director. I met him in line at Sundance uh, while we were waiting for like a David Diggs concert. Like, and like I was just like talking to him and then I realized like I saw like a few of his music videos and he was like oh geez like no one ever like talks to him about his work as much but through that I built a connection with him and then I found that he lives in Pasadena which is you know in LA County and through that I edited a few things for him he introduced me to people and over like two or three years I was just working on things that were kind of like not as good at first and then I just kept working my way up and edited better and better things and before I knew it I'd met so many people along the way that I was getting you know calls to edit totally random things like I got hit up to edit this like woman's birthday video for her mom like randomly but then I also got hit up to edit like a Dylan Francis music video and I was just like like it's such a weird thing with freelance because you get offered such bizarre things to edit but like it's all work so it's cool and like i've gotten to edit like legitimate music videos like i got to edit for like janelle monet for coachella because i knew like one person and like it's crazy how like meeting someone and being like oh you edit like show me like what you have and you can just send someone your website and it it can just be all smooth from there so it just took a couple years to kind of make money off what i was doing even if i didn't want to like do certain jobs And then all of a sudden you realize you're in like a zone where you're editing, you know, legitimate things for like big music festivals, music videos, really good short films, like commercial ads. I got to edit something for Tecate, which was like really like random because I don't like drink Tecate or stuff like that. But it's cool to like be affiliated with like brands and be like I've edited for, you know, Coachella, Tecate, Janelle Monet, like just these different things. And it's not like necessarily it's like a resume that you're building. And stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And it's cool because like the whole time I was just doing what I loved and meeting cool people. Right. And there there are a few bumps in the road, but like you just need to get to that part where you're consistently working and meeting people. And you you just realize like, oh shoot, I'm I'm there. Like I'm getting offers. And all of a sudden it's not where's my next job, but it's like, which job should I pick? And stuff like that. And that's a beautiful place to be at. And it's just nice to to realize when you get to the point where you can just pick up on, you know, what jo- jobs are going around and pe- new directors that are hitting you up and stuff like that. And yeah. It's great. Having those options work. I think, you know, freelancing for me, um, it's weird to call it freelancing because I technically have a business business, but really the freelancing part of the business is what has been able to uh, allow things like this to happen. But I feel like being a freelancer is such a high rewarding thing, yet it is so risky. Like you mentioned, I, you know, like going back to your story, you mentioned you could either like really work a lot for a certain company and, uh, and kind of like go up the ladder uh, for five years. Uh, but then you decided like, you know, that's not really for me. I'm going to go in and, and be a freelancer. And I just think that speaks a lot to like, if you want to do something, then maybe just do it. One of the reasons I, I left LA, uh, it was that for me to like commute to a job. And I know you live in LA, so I, it is also kind of different because you do work from home. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to like be... Uh, and not not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just my preference. I didn't want to be an office PA and work from eight, you know, to five, and then add like three hours of traffic uh, to the day, <laughs> and then like get home and not really have that you know enough money and it's expensive. And 
somehow that's supposed to get me to direct the film in 40 years. Like, I don't know how that, how that ladder really would work. And I, I just didn't want to play that game. Instead, like I came to Florida, I got a job that I enjoyed uh, while I was teaching film. And uh, that sustained me for a while and even like allowed me to, uh, during a summer, just make a feature film. And for me, what it took to make a feature film was to like play my own game and say, oh, I'm going to do my own thing because I think I, I don't need per anyone's permission to necessarily do what I love. And so for you, it was like, I wonder if you would have, if you would have followed the same path of like, I'm going to, you know, work the ladder, if you would have been able to have enough time or even make the connections that you did to uh, pull some of the gigs that you did. So uh, do you think editors should be more freelance based or you think it's just more like personality based? Depends what you want to do. If I would have kept that job in the like TV editing industry, like I would have made a lot of connections in that industry. Like it's like if I doing something that's a little more like freelance, I'm going to meet people who do music videos, people who do like vice documentaries, which are amazing, which I would love to do. People who are doing commercials and stuff like that. So it just depends. The The world that you put yourself in is where you're going to make your connections. And you can meet someone from this and that, but you like have to decide that you're going to have to pick like an area to like work your way into. And, you know, if I was in the TV industry for like four years and I was like, oh, I want to do freelance. Like, yeah, it would be cool to be like, oh, I was an assistant editor on like Hell's Kitchen and like CNN's whatever. Uh, not whatever. It's really cool stuff. <laughs> I love it. But, um, you know, like it's not going to translate as easy as you think. It's kind of like in Biola, it was like a private Christian university and you can't just be like going to like a, some junior college and be like, I have all these Bible credits. Will they amount, you know, account for anything? Like it just doesn't work that easily. Like you have to understand what you're working your way into. And if you love like the TV editing industry, that's amazing. Cause like, if you already have an in there, it's great. I remember meeting with a producer and talking about like what footage I was going to like go through. And he was, and he just like walked in and he was like, Oh God, he's like, don't ever say yes to meeting with random people. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, Oh, my friend's son like wants to work in the industry. And like, he just got out of film school and he just like, I don't know if I'm supposed to like get him a job or something, blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, it's just exhausting. I already got so much to do. Meanwhile, I'm this like 22 year old kid sitting in his office, like, getting ready to work with him and i was just like just like dang like i already have an end to this industry like i i i would categorize myself as the person he was describing but i'm already here and there's something to be said about that like if you do have an uh connection to like an aspect of editing you know you should learn a lot from it you should explore it like you shouldn't like just be defensive and be like, oh, I don't want to edit CNN documentaries. So like, I'm out. Meanwhile, you don't have like any other work coming your way. And like, there's nothing wrong with that either. But it's just like, there's like a perspective of understanding where you are. And like, I always go back to saying like, God puts you in weird places, and you don't understand it. That's like a big part of freelance. And when I look back, like, two or three years, I think like, like that made a lot more sense than it did at the time. Like why mm -hmm. I said no to this, why I couldn't do this, why I couldn't do that. And it just becomes like a trust thing. Like you're going to be in situations and you're going to have to like listen to whether or not you feel like you should be in this realm or not. But, you know, people just enter and exit your life and you, you can't be touchy about like leaving, you know, a certain company or something like that. Like you just have to kind of take it as you go. I actually started this job with this amazing editor named uh, Jen Kennedy. She's edited for like Kygo, Zed, 1975, all those dope music videos she edited. And I actually came in contact with her and was like, oh, this is what I want to do. Like, I, I would love to assist and edit for you. Meanwhile, like I had like done at least like six months of just assistant editing for her. And I was like in the world of like music videos. I was assistant editing stuff for like, I mean, I would never want to name drop like Justin Bieber, but like big videos with like big budgets and stuff like that. And like, I thought that's what I wanted to do too. And I was like exploring it. And I learned so much from that experience. But I also realized like there's a certain type of music video I want to do. And there's like connections I know from that area that I would like to pursue more instead of full-time assistant editing these like pop videos, which are really cool. But like, I just realized I didn't want to do, but there was nothing wrong 
with that experience that I had just beca- because, you know, I ended up not pursuing it full time because I learned so much. And Jen taught me how to be like a completely different editor. Like if you look her up, her credits are insane. And I was almost like feeling crazy to just be like, uh, sorry, I don't want to work for you anymore because she was like the editor that I wanted to be and stuff like that. But I realized like, I just felt the need to pursue like my own specific path and just get there. But I learned so much from the experience. And so you're going to meet the connections you do, but you have to understand that there's so many different areas of the people that you can meet and the type of jobs that you're going to work into. And you just have to be aware of that and just trust that you'll get there and work your butt off. You, you can't not work your butt off and accomplish this kind of a dream. It's just not, it's not going to happen. People aren't going to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself and the way you believe you're in yourself is putting yourself out there and doing the best you can. And that's hard work. Right. Yeah. Cause like, uh, you know, opportunity cost is a, is a real thing. Like you could be, you could theoretically be doing something else with your time uh, that could theoretically get you more money but then you know the the time you're investing into your dreams like that speaks a lot of whether you believe in that dream or not uh and yeah like to your to your point like if if someone just because you're um you know an editor or a director or whatever uh not every job that comes your way is necessarily the best job for you at the time uh i I'm a, I'm terrible actually at like saying no to certain jobs. Like that's like, that's the thing I need to learn how to like really distinguish that. Cause like for me, it's always like, I just, I can just outwork myself. Right. And it'll be all okay at the end. And then you realize that, uh, you, you end up neglecting something like the trade off is there. Uh, it's just like, it's, it's like thinking about time as like, if I get to do something, that means I'm not doing something else. And it's just, and when it, you see it like that, it, it can, it can get iffy, like saying yes to everything, but yeah, then, then like rather pursue the things that you, you find meaningful and that you think you're good at. So let me ask you this question. What does creative freedom mean? And, and how do you achieve that? Dang, that is, that is a, that is a question to ask. I think it's crazy to think about. I, I feel like the most creative freedom you ever have is when you're like a kid playing with your mom's camera and making movies in your backyard. Like that is full creative freedom. The more you work and work in this industry, the more you work for producers, directors, but like as an editor, like I'm working for so many people that have a say in what I'm doing and stuff like that. Like you'll have producers be like, oh, we don't like this. We need to change that. And then the director disagrees with that producer. And then the artist is like, wait, I don't know if I like either of those ideas. What if we try this? And you're just like, what? Like, you feel like a button pushing monkey. Like you don't, it it, it doesn't always feel like you have all the freedom in the world. Um, But I mean, I was talking to my bud, Jordan Orm. He's a insane music video editor out by Azusa. And he was just talking about like, like having to balance things is like an insanely hard thing to do. Cause it goes from like, being creative and making cool ideas to then like pleasing people who don't necessarily have all the right ideas. And you're just trying to balance that. And it's just stressful. He had this story where he was editing a music video for Tyga rapper. I'm not like the biggest, biggest rap person, but he said like he had spent like, like what, like three hard days of work editing this thing for a deadline. And then Tyga came into the studio and looked at the edit, was just like, nah like in front of him and then he had to like rechange everything else and it was just like a nightmare and it's just hard to like bounce back to what creative freedom is i feel like there's this beautiful thing called collaboration and you kind of have to understand how to make it work the best for you and you know you have to understand how to make your ideas heard and also understand like whose project it really is like who you're servicing because you're some, as an editor, like you're someone's editor in that sense. So you have to work with them. You have to give them, you know, all your insight. And basically they're hiring you because of your perspective. Not everyone sees things the way that you do. But, you know, people are hiring you to be the creative that you are and to say things that work for you and things that don't and to weigh that with the way the director thinks or not. Like that's, that's what we're essentially being hired to do is to basically give our opinions 
and translate it into, you know, an editing timeline Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there's like a mix with different creative freedom, like options, I guess. Uh, It depends what you're working on too. I've been doing some sizzle reels for like these Netflix companies that want to pitch TV ideas. And you're basically making like a fake trailer for a show that doesn't exist to be shown at pitch meetings. And you don't have to worry about copyright. You can literally use any footage you've ever used. Like there are no rules. Like that is creative freedom. That is, that is fun. But like also like no one's ever going to really see those except for the people in pitch meetings. Cause like you can't post it. You can't do stuff like that. Uh, but like it, it, it's cool to do a project like that every once in a while and kind of just flex your creative muscles and be given all this freedom to do whatever you want. But I feel like as far as creative freedom goes, it, it lessens the more you get experience and the bigger projects you do because of like the types of people who are pouring money and time into this are in charge along mm-hmm. with you. And you just have to like understand where your opportunities are to speak creatively and to like say your opinions and, and how to delegate those. I think it becomes more of a communication thing with other people what creative freedom is the more you work your way up. I think uh, yes, I I think so filmmaking for this question like it's really particular because it is collaboration. That's like asking like a basketball or like a, like a soccer player like do you ever really have freedom and unless you're like Kobe Bryant, you really don't. <laughs> like you you're always in in service of so many things that are even beyond your control. Uh, not just like, I, I think a, an editor is like a particular, uh, particularly hard one because you're always under the direction of like, you mentioned like producers and directors, but even as a director and a writer, uh, if the writer doesn't, you know, I, me as a writer, when I write, I, I don't have the creative freedom to write a spaceship into my movie. Not that I would do that, but still like, I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily something I'm looking for. I think, um, one thing I keep coming back to is always like being able to choose the projects that you want and working with the people that you want. Like it's always, uh, I see that as creative freedom. Like someday if like I'm retired, it uh, doesn't mean that I will want to work for myself and only listen to my own things and my own opinion and my own, uh, I guess, creative I don't know, space, I don't know. But I, I, I would want to work with other people as well. It's just like having that cre- that freedom to choose who you work with. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of projects you say no to, uh, which is really awesome that y- you get to even have that power and that um, option. Because I feel like even people starting up don't have that creative freedom. And it's okay because like the more you work, the more freedom that's given to you. But I feel like there's, because you've already handled that freedom, because you've already kind of like, work your way to really uh, have that freedom, uh, you've also become a good craftsman. So you do you do deserve that freedom and that freedom is gonna serve you well. Um, so, all right, man, thanks for, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you coming over and uh, giving us your editing insight. Totally, man, it's been great. Good to talk to you again.